Welcome to the Leesburg Talk Podcast. My name is John Kelly. I'm the disciple-making minister here at Leesburg Christian Church. And my name is John Welch, and I'm here at Leesburg. And he's our senior minister. Don't let him fool you. Uh, this is our first time delving into video podcasting. We've just been doing the audio thing. We're vodcasting today, aren't we? We're vodcasters. It's going to be great. It's going to be great. So uh, this is our first time doing it. So if you're watching this on YouTube, hope you enjoy it. I hope we do a good job with it. Um, as long as John's face is on here, we know we're in good shape because it will make up for this over here. But uh, John, this past week was Mother's Day. Mother's Day. And it was a beautiful, beautiful Mother's Such Day. Such a cool day. Yeah. I mean, how many kids were up on that stage being dedicated on Sunday morning? My understanding is we had 39 children from 29 families. Man. Yeah. That cool is stuff. absolutely incredible. I've, yeah. You know, I've been in ministry for pushing 30 years now, and I have never seen that many kids yeah. In, in a child dedication Sunday. Yeah, it was cool. It now, was cool. Now, do you want to explain to people the difference between child dedication and uh, maybe other ceremonies that sure. churches do? So child dedication service is really not necessarily about the child as much as it is about the parents. Uh, and, the, and the idea there is the parents deciding and, and dedicating and deciding and uh, 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 vowing to raise their children to... as to the best of their ability to come to know the Lord. Right. And so we, 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 we can't, you know, we're not responsible for the outcomes with our grown children and what they do, uh, but we can do stuff and be intentional with while they're under our care. And so that's what that was all about. It's not about saving your children. It's about uh, being intentional as a parent, as mom, dad, caregiver, whoever, um, to, to, to bring up that child to know the Lord. Well, and not just as a parent, but as a church. Because we actually ask the church to reply and respond yeah. in kind throughout the, the ceremony. Yeah. You, you look in the early church in Acts, and you, and you see that the church did life together. And so um, uh, they were there for one another. They supported one another with, with not just uh, uh, financial or physical needs, but, but also emotional and spiritual needs. And so that's part of the, the, the responsibility of the church uh, still today. Uh, to to care for and to uplift these families, yeah, and uh, it takes a village. Yeah, you know, yeah. it really does yeah. take a village. Yeah, I hate that phrase, but yeah, I mean, it's yeah. the truth. Yeah, it's true. It it's takes, the truth. Yeah, and uh, it gets used a lot. Yeah, but it is true. It yeah. is true. So this past Sunday, um, you talked about parenting with intentionality. Mm -hmm. Basically, the idea that um, <coughs> whether we realize it or not, as as adults, as parents, we are discipling our children. Yeah. Uh, do you want to kind of well, Give some, some you know, talk on that. sometimes we hear the word disciple and we think of like a spiritual ninja. You right, know, it's, right, it's a right. professional something. Um, one of the things that is hard for us to sometimes grasp is the fact that we're already discipling our kids. We're already discipling people within our path, mm -hmm. whether it's coworkers I work with or whatever. We're, we're teaching them who we are and what we believe, and they're catching stuff. Uh, someone has said, that you are the sum of the five people that surround you. Right, right. Um, so you're discipling someone. Let's be sure that we're intentional about what we're producing there. We want to decide. We want to disciple our children into into Jesus followers, and so uh, so being intentional with our time. Uh, Deuteronomy six says, you know, when you're standing up and when you're laying down, when you're walking down the road and when you're sitting around the house. Talk about the, the law of the Lord. And that's the same st still for us today, taking every opportunity we have. You know, it's so easy to, you know, just turn on the TV and zo zone out for three hours or um, turn on the radio or get on your phone or whatever and just tune out. Right. What if we tuned in to, to the fact that our kids are watching us and, 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 and what we value, they're going to learn to value. You know, it's funny you say that. Yeah, because I would say one of the the greatest discipleship opportunities we have with our kids is when we're driving a car. Oh yeah, because I they're mean, stuck with you. Oh, they're they're stuck with you, and all they hear is what you say. Yeah, and I can't tell you like I what I hate, and this is just me. I'm a terrible like road rage is is my um it's my cross to bear, John. Okay, which okay. is a terrible statement, but I'm going to say it anyways. Uh, but I can't stand when you are on a 55 mile an hour road on a beautiful day 
and the person in front of you is driving 37 miles an hour. And, and we all I've know gotta, his name. And I've got to be somewhere. I've got to be somewhere. And and they're causing me to not get where I need to go in the time that I want to get there. And so I'm not happy about it. Yep. And so I'll be like, come on, man, let's go. Let's go. Yeah. And I've caught my kids now. We'll be driving along and we're driving actually at an okay speed, but the kids want to go faster. Yeah. So all of a sudden you'll hear my kids say, come on, let's go yeah, <laughs> in the so back funny. seat. And so they pick up on the things that you say and the things that you do. And whether we like it or not, they typically pick up on our negative things more than they pick up on our positive things. Yeah. And so the things that we don't like about ourselves or the things that we struggle with the most, a lot of times those are the things that our children pick up on and emulate. And so what you said about being aware of those eyes being on you at all times, yeah. man, we gotta be, we gotta be aware of that yeah. because one of the things our kids will pick up our good traits, but it seems like they really pick up our negative traits. And maybe our negative traits are amplified in our children. Yeah, they might yeah. be. Yeah. Like the things I really get frustrated with, with, with Nora, for example, um, like I, I see that because I see that in me. I, mean, oh, I wonder why that frustrates me so much in her. It could be because it frustrates me so much in me. Right. And now I see it in her and it frustrates me even more. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Hmm. So you 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 said there's there are competing de there are competing demands in our lives. Parents often have multiple responsibilities <laughs> and distractions, jobs, personal responsibilities, financial oh, yeah. security, so societal pressures. Um, and parents can unintentionally put the most important thing, that being their children, on the back burner. Yeah. Yeah, it's 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 tough. Like you know, we've you know we're in an election year, so so that's going to amp up as we get closer to fall with the with the political stuff. Uh, our economy stinks, and so I mean, there's no rest layer inside. Right. Um. So we've got bills, and we've got jobs, and we've got bosses, and we've got employees. You know, we've got all this stuff. We've got this this cultural drive that wants us to keep up with, um the halves you know what i mean yeah kind of like so, the joneses the idea yeah, of I mean, uh, being keeping up with the joneses yeah kind of so thing. if i if i don't have a, a newer truck or a boat and a jet ski how could i ever be happy you know and john here's the thing so you pursue those things here's the thing john i know in you i don't have to worry about that because i've seen your truck well you have a two-tone toyota yeah and it's two-tone yeah because of body work yeah so what you need to understand is and I'll just confess, not necessarily privately, but publicly, uh, that I envy really nice trucks. Oh, I'm sure. I, I really, really do. Um, man, I look at some of these trucks and I'm like, boy, I'd love to have something like that. Right. Um, almost to a sinful degree. Oh, wow. Oh, yeah, truthfully. I mean, it's and a hot so, take. This hot is a hot take, take right now. So so I so I, so I I really do. I, I struggle with that desire to have stuff. Yeah. You know, I have a hard time throwing stuff away. Now, I do know that. We've talked yeah, about that before. Yeah, so, um, so, yeah, I mean, my, my truck is a, is a humbling project. Mm. It keeps me humble. I, I hear you. I hear you. Well, I know for my truck, if you ever look at my truck, if you look at it from a distance, you're like, man, that's really nice. And then you get up on it and you look under the doors and you see the rust. Yeah. yeah. I mean, there's one side that John, it's, it's yeah. going to take some major surgery to fix that side of the truck. And I can't tell you how many times, like you said, I see some of the guys in our church who have some really nice trucks and they pull up in those. My buddy, Adam Tipton. Yeah. He's got a nice uh, truck. I call this truck Johnny cash. Yeah. Cause it's all black. Yeah. I mean, the wheels are black. The, the, Paint is black. The logos are black. Yeah. Every it's just one of those yeah. cool trucks. And when you get inside, it's got he's the got nice a, seats. He's got and, a, uh, uh, like a two two three ran as an antenna. Oh yeah, I mean yeah, just it's cool. just it's like Mad Max. It, it, it's a yeah. man's truck. Yeah. And every time I see that thing, I'm just like, do, man. Do you recall my old truck? I had an eighty six. Oh yeah, uh, eighty six Dodge Dakota. Yeah. And that thing, you know, the girls call it, you know, Rusty Krusty. Yeah. Um, you drove the wheels off that thing. Literally. Yeah. Yeah. So anyway, whatever. So so we've got all these things that can pull our attention and, and become our priority um, that, that we neglect 
the most important gift that we have, which is our kids. Yeah. You know, the scripture teaches us that that our children are a gift from the Lord. They're entrusted to us. And, and you think back to the parable of the talents and, and, and uh, uh, the, 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 the main character in, in, in the parable gives a portion of talents to each of his servants based on their ability and capacity. Mm-hmm. Um, and he came back and expected his, his, his deposit to yield interest, essentially. And that's the same thing with our kids. They're being entrusted to us. The question is, how am I handling my master's children? Yeah, what, what is God's return on investment? Yeah. Because he's investing those children into us, and he's, he's allowing he's us. He's entrusting them to us. He's yeah. allowing us to raise his children. Yeah. And I think when, when that's the mindset we take on, it changes parenting completely. Yeah. Because when we look at it as they're our kids, yeah. which, I mean, in a sense, they're our kids. Sure. But when we realize yeah. we're raising God's children, and he has trusted us to take care of and love and care for and raise these children, man, that just changes the whole narrative oh, yeah. on how we should be doing things. Yep. And it's I, I'm glad you mentioned that. I'm glad you brought that up because that's something I have to remind myself of. Yeah. I mean, I've been in ministry, like I said earlier, almost 30 years, and there are times, don't even do it. Don't even do it, John. I'm done. I'm done. Don't even do it. Uh, no, but uh, there, there are times when... Uh, I have to sit back and go, hold up. Yeah. Am I teaching them something right. that they don't need in their lives? Yeah. Am I teaching them something that's actually going to hurt them long term? Yeah. And and it's so important as parents that we realize our kids, they're not just our kids. Mm-hmm. Yeah. That when we're raising these kids, they're going to be adults one day. <coughs> and guess what they're going to do? Potentially raise other kids. Yeah. And then those kids, it, you know, the idea of the sins of the father, yeah, they really do last. Oh, Something sure. that you instill in your kids, they could instill in their kids, that they instill in their kids, that they instill yeah. in their kids, it can last for generations. Yeah. Um, I, I know a lot of people who their whole goal in life was to break a cycle. They were oh, raised yeah. in a certain cycle and they wanted to break that cycle. Yeah. I've got a lot of good friends who are doing great, but they told me they said life was hard for them growing up because they didn't want to be like how they were raised. Yeah. I really hope when my kids are adults, they don't look back and go, man, I had to break that cycle. Mm-hmm. You yeah. know, I, I, I want to make sure yeah. my kids are raised in a way that they go, I want my kids to be raised the way my parents raised me. Yeah. Yeah. Oh yeah. There's absolutely generational sin that impact, excuse me, uh, that impacts us and um, uh, impact and will impact our children. And yeah. so uh, whether it's, uh, you know, I mean, often it's substance abuses and it's uh, it's selfishness, chronic selfishness. Um, um, yeah, so you've got to be aware of that as a parent. And then we've got to understand that the kids that we're raising today, like they're growing up in a world vastly different than what you and I grew up in. Right. Or I grew up in and vastly, vastly different from the world you grew up in. Right. And uh, so, I, I mean, they've got all kinds of things that are pulling their attention. And that's always been the case, but but different now. Mm-hmm. I can't imagine as a, you know, I, I mean, a, a young child having unrestricted internet access. Oh, I know. Yeah, I, I, I would have been set up for failure in that situation as as a child. And and, and truthfully, we're seeing that generationally. We're seeing uh, this youngest generation that's always grown up with a with internet, a screen, uh, and, and a screen. We're seeing. Uh, the, the ramifications of that. Mm-hmm. Um, and so not to go down that road too far, but you, you know, you've got, you've got issues there. You've got the, a whole vastly different world that our kids are growing up in, you know, the, um, the sexual ethic when I was a child, um, was the, the Bible people would say it's, it was liberal. Um, but it's not nearly as liberal as it is now. As far as right, um, uh, uh, the opposite of biblically conservative, and so, um, you know, it's just a different world. Mm-hmm. I mean, we, we I, I didn't grow up thinking, okay, here comes June, and so it's going to be uh, rainbows all over the place because right, of, uh, that wasn't a part of my normal world. Our kids are growing up in that world. Well, I think we're we're seeing our kids <laughs> grow up in a post-Christian America. 
not postmodern, post-Christian. Yeah. It's something that's been going on in Europe for decades, oh, yeah. but it's just now really hitting the states. Um, when we went to Honduras last year, uh, I took a group of guys from the church I was I was with before, and uh, we were driving through Tegucigalpa, and the American embassy was coming up. Nowhere in the country of Honduras did you see anything about Pride Month until you saw the American embassy. Yeah. And there was a huge, huge banner out in front of the American embassy celebrating Pride Month in a country that doesn't celebrate Pride Month. Yeah. And, and so America is actually becoming, I want to say, in some ways, a leader in sin culture, in, in making it um, almost law yeah. to celebrate sin, yeah. which I never, I've never experienced that in my life until now. But my kids are going to grow up in a culture where that sin culture and it being almost legislated to celebrate is going to be just normal daily life. That terrifies me, John. That terrifies me for my kids and even more so for my grandkids because if it's that bad now, imagine 30 years from now oh, yeah. what it's going to be like. Yeah, I can't pull it up here. I'm trying to, but I can't remember what I titled the sermon. But back in June of last year, uh, I was preaching a message, and I referenced this article that um, it was a scholarly study um, that had investigated or researched the 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 um, normal perception, the average perception of Christianity in America. Yeah, and I can't remember the years exactly, but you know. Uh, leading up to 97, for example, to be a Christian was a generally positive thing. You know, everyone in town that, w- that had a position of authority generally or or, or uh, influence would be a Christian of some, of some form. And then from 97 to 2002, 2005, something like that, uh, it was neutral. It didn't hurt you, but it didn't help you. And then this article suggests from the early thousands, maybe 2012 it, it amped up um to to now it's been generally negative you know the the christian ethic the christian worldview is seen by popular culture as a negative thing and uh, and that's the world our kids are growing up in and so they're they're seeing that taught subconsciously through kids cartoons on i don't know if they're saturday morning cartoons anymore but through right through uh kid net programming that the Christian ethic is, is bad. Well, and I have a friend who was in LA for years and he worked in the movie industry. I'm sorry. I know. And well, he's, he, he was able to hold on to his faith throughout that time. But one of the things that he told me was there was an underground group of Christian people in the movie industry that had to meet underground to even talk conservative politics, because if they were heard in public, even talking about it, they could lose jobs they could be blacklisted. Um, it, it was ugly. And so there was a group and some very famous, famous actors who were part of this, mm-hmm. this underground uh, conservative Christian group. Um, and I would say their names, but I honestly, I don't want to do that because yeah. I don't want to. I mean, we're a small podcast, but it can they're still gonna, they're going to watch. Let's be honest. Everybody watches this podcast, but um, <clears throat> it's our first video. We're going to have like eight billion views on this thing. It's ridiculous. Oh, wow. But uh, I, they they had to hide to talk. It, it reminded me a lot of the first century church, to be honest with you, where they had to meet in secret so as not to be arrested. And the way that a lot of people are wondering, why, why is the ichthus or the fish symbol um, a symbol of Christianity? Well, that was what they put on their doors. So that people knew this was a safe place to worship. Yeah. And and so the the idea of the fish, because they were to be fishers of men, the idea of the fish or the ichthus to be put on the doors yeah. was a symbol. So people knew that they had a safe place where they could meet. And I think we're moving and inching closer and closer to where here in America, that may be a thing eventually That's, for I'll, us. I'll tell you now, I'm not meeting in secret. Kill me. That's fair. Yeah. 
That's I mean, I, I can't. I, I'm not going to do that. But but I'm okay with going home. I, I hear that. <laughs> I hear that. You know. So it would a cheap plug for the uh, Leesburg Daily Podcast. We're actually talking about eternity this week. There you go. On Monday, we talked about eternity. What is it? And yesterday, we talked about heaven. And today, we just talked about hell. So uh, well, that's fun. It's it's some it's hot topic. It's some hot topics going on here, people. Let me tell you something. You're gonna love this. But uh, I'll be honest, man. Uh, we are heading towards Christianity. Yeah, could be outlawed in our time. Sure. Yeah. It, it may not be yeah. until after we're gone, but there's a strong possibility it could happen in yeah. our time. Yeah. And, and and truly, it comes down to what can you live with and what can you live without. You know, Jesus says, you, de- you, you deny me before man, I'll deny you before my father. Um, let's say the things get w- worse, which they probably will. Um, I mean, the Bible tells right. us that things yeah. are going to so, get worse. We know that in Scripture, we're not told it's going to get better for us. Right. So so, so they come and they say, John, uh, are you a Christian? I'd hope that we would both say, yeah, absolutely. Shoot me if you want. Okay. Uh, but sometimes that might be harder to do. What if they say, John, um, are you a Christian? They're, gonna, they're not going to shoot you, but they're going to tax you insanely. An insane or amount. they're going to take over or, your bank account. Or yeah, they'll seize your accounts or they'll seize your house or your property. You know, what then? Take away and, your children. And, you know, yeah. I think we've all got to decide, uh, well, where's my faith? Well, I will say, if you look through history, when the church has had to go underground, that's when it's grown the most. Yeah. When the church has been illegal, that's when the most yeah. people come to Christ. Yeah. Um, you, you think about Jesus himself. You, you even said it, you know, he kind of hacked people off with the things he said. Um, yeah. His teachings were kind of offensive to church leaders when he said, I am the bread of life, eat my flesh, yeah. drink my blood. I mean, these are things that vampires do, right? But yeah. he's <laughs> but he's uh but he's actually telling people to do these things and he's saying that he is God. Yeah. That he's the son of God and that he is God. And his teachings were offensive and people wanted him out. So that Christianity was kind of started under duress. Yeah. It was never started under prosperity. Right. It was always something that came under duress, and it only makes sense that w- if Christianity does become illegal in America, watch out for the church to it just simply explode during yeah. that time. Yeah, yeah. You know, in John 6 is where that eat my flesh comes from, and Jesus had just said, I'm the bread of life, and then he continues and he continues that analogy about, about him being that source to the point of saying, eat my flesh and drink my blood. Right. Now, he's not really meaning eat my flesh and drink my right. blood. Uh, but it's an illusion to what will happen uh, on the cross. It's an illusion and a and a and a metaphor of sorts for for how he's going to give himself to the people and and, and for uh, what they how they will remember that in the future with yeah, communion. Yeah, yeah. Um, but the people there responded quite negatively. You know, I, I, I think the saddest verse in the Bible. I never realized it until this past week studying this. Uh, John six sixty six. The saddest verse, one of the saddest verses in the Bible. At that point, many of his disciples turned and followed him no more. That's a sad verse. And is it interesting? I don't know if this is intentional of God had planned this, but the fact it's 666 is the number of the Antichrist. Right? And, well, yeah, that's my point. And the Antichrist is the opposite of Jesus. And these people literally turned their backs and walked in the opposite direction. You know... We talk about repentance, and the idea of repentance is to turn around and walk away and change. That's what we're called to. When when it, Acts two thirty eight says repent and be baptized, yeah. it's not saying be baptized and try to be better. It's saying no, 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 no. Right. Turn your ways around, change who you are, and be baptized. And these people repented of Jesus. Yeah, I mean, if you really think about it, that's what they're doing. Yeah. And you want to talk about an anti Christ thing to do? Yeah. Repenting of Jesus. Yeah. The literal opposite of what we're called to do mm-hmm. as believers in tr- in Christ. Yeah. 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 Super, super sad. After this, it says, many of his disciples turned back and walked and no longer walked with him. 
or followed him no more. Yeah. Uh, sad situation. You know, it's interesting that, that John identifies them. He describes them as disciples. Mm -hmm. Now you've got the 12 disciples, right? His inner core. But you've got hundreds of disciples. Per, yeah, that have followed him around for a that while. That have followed him around for a while. And many turned around and followed him no more because of the hard teachings he was teaching. Now, so the question becomes, well, what's the hard teaching? You know, he did the eat my flesh, drink my blood stuff. They understood this is metaphor. They, they got that. You know, there's no way they're, right. you know. Um, it was hard not for them to understand, but to accept. Right. Jesus is demanding complete allegiance. I'm number one. I'm number one in your life. I'm more important than, than, than your family. Right. I'm more important than your job. I'm more important than your ESPN package, you know? Like, I'm, I'm more important. John, you're pushing know, it now, man. Ooh, there's going to be people out. on here really angry with you yeah. now. Yeah, my sports people. Yeah, that Kentucky basketball um, fan I, base listen, is going to, they're going to be angry yeah, with you, I man. I know, I get it. Hope, nope. Um, so, oh, I, I don't know. If you are not from Kentucky, you don't get that. But if you are from Kentucky, John just made enemies really fast. And here's the thing. Just say I, I don't know about Pope. Mark I don't Pope. care about Mark Pope. You just like care. you just like stirring the pot. I just think it's fun. It's fun. It was. Uh, did you ever watch Parks and Rec? Uh, maybe a couple episodes. It's hilarious. But Leslie Nope is the girl's name, and she runs for uh, like city council on it. And the the they com, the uh, person she's running against made up signs. Nope. Uh, uh, nope. Nope. Or whatever. <laughs> So when I think of Pope, I think of Pope Nope. Pope Nope. I like it. Say I Nope like it. to Pope or Nope to Nope. Anyway. I, I like I like in verses 68 through 69. Peter says, Lord, to whom shall we go? Because he asked him, he says, are you going to leave me also? And he says, well, whom shall we go? He said, you have the words of eternal life. And we have believed and have come to know that you are the Holy One of God. Yeah. That was a huge statement. Uh -huh. Because... We've all dealt with peer pressure. We've all dealt with mob mentality. And it's very easy for any one of us to get caught up in the mob mentality. It's very easy for any one of us to get caught up in going with what everybody else is doing. And it was oh, yeah. it would have been very I mean, easy for those yeah. disciples to just be like, man, Jesus, you're, you're taking this a little too far. I, yeah. I, man, I'm one of your inner circle, and I'm even concerned right yeah. now. Yeah. But Peter... Man, he flipped that narrative on its on its back and, and did it different. Yeah. You know, the mom mentality is a dangerous thing, and that's something we need to watch out with our kids and talk with them about. Yeah. You know, in recent history, as in this past weekend, um, did you watch any of the news? And you've got graduation ceremonies across the country at these universities that are being hijacked by uh, protesters that are anti-Israel Whatever. Right, right, right. And so they throw a fit. And I hope every uh, every employer <laughs> investigates, like when you're hiring one of these college graduates and uh, and you see some, you know, nitwit uh, destroying a graduation ceremony. I, I hope that sticks on their resume. I really do. Yeah. Just because I'm vengeful. Um, but uh, <laughs> it's, it's, that's one of those sins that John has to work on a little bit. There. Yeah, probably. <laughs> I, I mean, I just think, listen, there's, there's always consequences for your stupidity. Oh, absolutely. And so absolutely. you've got, but, but I mean, you've got these universities that are shut down that have shut down classes for the rest of the semester and canceling graduation. Um, because of these protesters ruining these... ruining moments for people not just yeah it, it's not like you're just hitting things that don't really matter right this is a once in a lifetime yeah. your family's coming in from all over the place to see you and walk probably across paid that hundreds stage. of thousands of dollars oh yeah you know yeah and and that's going to be destroyed because of some nitwit who's whose knowledge of the Middle East and the history there goes back to breakfast at best. Yeah. Really? Well, and not only that, but just the fact that um, you're not helping your cause. No. You're not helping your cause in the least bit. It's it's not one of those things where uh, by by doing this, people are going, you know what? They're calling me an idiot and saying I'm stupid. So you know what? They're probably right. I'm yeah. going to go there. <laughs> that Ugh. just doesn't work like that. So – but 
I mean, we see that those crowds are growing. Yeah. Because there's excitement and there's energy and there's passion. And so people will follow it. The same thing happened back in 2020 when you've got all the race stuff going on uh, and you've got city cities that are destroyed because of this mom mentality. And the question is, well, what, what are we protesting, guys? We don't care. Let's tear it down. Well, I mean, you can and, go even further back, John, and you can go back to post-World War One Germany. Sure. To this guy Hitler shows up with this Nazi party, yeah. and he gets everybody riled up and yeah. excited. And yeah. what do they do? It was the inhumane Jews. things, yeah. Yeah, like yeah. terrible things sure. to people, yeah. simply because he had the energy and the charisma yeah. to lead people. I tell people all the time, Hitler might have been one of the greatest preachers of all time. Yeah. He just preached the wrong gospel. Yeah, he's creepy, but powerful uh, order ish. But he knew how to. He knew how to massage the message into the ears of the people. Yeah. And so no one, and here's the thing, no one wanted to stand up and be that guy that was like, ah, this is, this sounds really bad, guys. What, 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 yeah. Yeah. Uh, so Bonhoeffer's writings through, throughout that are are really neat to read. You know, in, 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 in Germany, the church divided largely. I just recently came across these numbers. Of the churches who rejected um, uh, the Nazi push, mm -hmm. it was one sixth of churches. That was the confessing church. They said, "We don't want anything with you. We don't want anything to do with you." One sixth, a, a second sixth, um, was angry at the first sixth of pastors and churches who said this was bad. Like, oh, those people, they're just extremists, you know, uh, you know, they took issue with the people that were speaking out. Right. The overwhelming majority of churches in Nazi Germany kept their mouths shut. They were apathetic. They didn't say a word. Yep. They didn't say here or here. They were, well, um, they were lukewarm. They were wasteful. Mm -hmm. They weren't beneficial in any way. So... So yeah, so so you know that that's again. This is the world our kids are growing up in, and we've got to, we've got to. You know, I remember having long and meaningful conversations with my kids um, during the the riots and all that nonsense in 2020. And you know, Nia is old enough; she understands more, or understand more, nor didn't understand quite as much. But you, you've got to, ha we've got to train our. You know, here, here's here's the danger we'll have: we'll shelter our children so much from the world. That they don't know how to handle it when they when they encounter it. Yeah, we've got to train our children to be able to maneuver in well, this crazy world. And I'm going to speak to homeschool parents here. It's great Terrible. that you're homeschooling. I think it's great that you're doing it, but make sure you're putting kids in situations where they can see sin. I know it sounds oh, yeah. terrible, oh, yeah. but if you shelter them to the point where they never see it, you send them off to college, even a Bible college. Yeah. I'm going to tell you, we knew the homeschool kids in Bible college yeah. because they were the ones who were getting into everything. Yeah. They were the ones who were going out drinking all weekend. Yeah. They were the ones that were out partying because they'd never experienced it. They never knew anything about it and had no way of knowing how to... Um, deal with the temptation or say no to it mm -hmm. because they'd never been presented with it before. Yeah. And so homeschool parents don't shelter your kids to the point where uh, they don't experience seeing sin mm -hmm. and knowing how to uh, say no or, or stay away from it yeah. um, by just sheltering them. Yes. Educationally, I get it 100%. But when it comes to social interaction and things, you've got to put them in positions where they understand yeah. what real life is like. We live a very easy life in America compared to the first century church. Oh, yeah. The things that kids saw back then would blow your mind compared to what we see now. Things like like death wasn't hidden from them like we do from our kids nowadays. Yeah. I know a lot of parents, they won't even talk about death around their kids because they, they want to, they want to quote unquote, protect their kids from talking about that. Um there was none of that in the first century church. Uh, we've got to be really careful that we don't shelter our kids to a point where we're actually hurting them. Yeah. And, and that comes, that comes again, back to one of the things we talked about this past weekend was um, instruction and discipline. We've got to instruct and, and discipline our children. You know, discipline, we, all, we always think of that word as whooping their tails when they're bad. And of course we have to do that too, but. But it's more than that. It's it's 
cultivating a, a human. And teaching a lesson within the midst of that punishment. Yeah, yeah. John, I'm going to tell you a story. Okay. Can I give you a story? Sure. You're probably going to laugh because I've already told you a story, yeah. but I, I, these people haven't heard the story. Okay. Uh, the other day, or a couple weeks ago, actually, I, I sat down with my son, and, and we he, he told me he wanted to go backpacking with me, which, of course— you know, pulled at my heartstrings because you know my love for backpacking and being in the outdoors. So my son tells me he wants to go backpacking. So I'm like, great. Well, his only backpack weighs like 150 pounds because it's one of those Star Wars kids sleeping bags that's like super heavy. I think I said backpack. I meant to say sleeping bag. But uh, but it's this heavy sleeping bag. I am not backpacking with that in my backpack. Sorry. Get that out of my so, backpack. I told him we would go online and we'd buy him one that's for backpacking, but a kid size. And I've got a friend who runs a, a company up in Michigan that makes backpacking quilts, which that's a story for another day. If you want to find out about it, contact me. I'll let you know what that is. But um, this episode is sponsored by the Backpacking Podcast. Yeah. Um, no, anyways, but uh, I I uh, I got online and he and I sat down and I let him pick out the colors and all that kind of stuff. And we ordered it. and He was all excited. So a couple days ago, it comes in. And so I'm like, Jack, I got a surprise for you. And so I came to him and I brought the sleeping bag out and he looks at it and he goes, that's it. Well, that's not a good surprise. I had a realization in that moment, John. I'm going to beat this child. No, <laughs> not. I mean, you could have. I mean, maybe the thought crossed yeah. my mind, but I didn't follow through it. That was Let's called temptation. How, how hard I can throw you against the wall. Temptation is not sin, yeah. right? Okay. Yeah, that's right. Um, but no, I. I had a realization of maybe we have spoiled our kids a little bit. That maybe we have done too much for them, given them too many things that they want, and we haven't actually raised them in a way where they're grateful for gifts. And so I talked to my son. I said, you know what, son? That's the wrong attitude. And I said, so we're going to go through your toys. And the ones you're not playing with, we're going to get rid of them, bud. We're going to give them to somebody else. And the just immediate tears that came out when I realized my son, his things are so important and that he only wants what he wants. He wants, when he gets a surprise, he wants it to be something that's big and huge all the time. Can't do that. Yeah. Can't do that. We've got, we got to dial back. Yeah. Son, here's your surprise. Yeah. I'm not going to beat you. We're going to get rid of your stuff. Yeah. Well, I looked yeah. at him and I immediately said, well, do you want me to sell this then? Yeah. When, when I showed it to him and he said, well, it's not a good surprise. Well, do you want me to sell it and ten, send it back? I mean, he goes, well, no, no, no. Yeah. And I'm like, okay. Yeah. But I had to teach him a lesson and we're actually going to be um, taking those toys and we're going to sell them in a yard sale so that he is contributing to us buying a house this year. There you go. Um, but teaching him, we don't, you, you're yeah. spoiled. We're not yeah. going to be yeah. spoiled. And that's part of discipline. It's part of cultivating a little human. And so, yeah. so it's not just you know whooping their tails, but it's 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 teaching them how to think and how to engage in society and how you know that's part of discipline. You know, and um, and 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 the instruction is dealing with warnings and don't go this way, go this way. If you go this way, son, uh, daughter, uh, you, you'll you'll hit potholes and w whatever. And so, um. I think it's a lot of just instilling Galatians 5, yeah. the fruit of the Spirit. Yeah. It just instilling that in our kids yeah. love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self control. Yeah. And in the midst of all of that, being madly in love with God in the process. And yeah. if we can teach those things to our kids, if we can instill those things in our kids, it's going to be amazing the kinds of children we're going to raise. Yeah. But in order to do that, we have to emulate those things yeah, that's right. mm -hmm. with them. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, man, I don't know how we got there. Um, hmm. That's it's what happens in but this yeah, podcast, there man. You go. We always so, we, this is how we work. But I will say, um, you you put on here self reflection on the type of Christian we are matters. Yeah. Are yeah. we a true disciple or are we one who walks away? Yeah, yeah, yeah. We we've we've really got to answer that question really repeatedly. Am I going to obediently follow Jesus? Um, am I going to be a true disciple? Um, because there are times where Jesus tells us and calls us to do things we don't want to do. He calls us to live in a way that we don't want to live. Sometimes I desire my sinfulness more than my obedience. Right. Uh, and so I've got to die to self on a regular basis to uh, 
to pursue Jesus. Exactly. I mean, and, and as we've said here before, a disciple is one who follows Jesus, is changed by Jesus, and is committed to the mission of Jesus. In other words, uh, do our kids see that? Do our kids see that, or do they see when things get hard, we cringe, we back down, yeah. and we don't follow through with our faith? Yeah. That's it. That's, the, that's, that's about it. the biggest message we can give our kids. The most important thing we can do is be intentional with our kids. Yeah. You know, finally, we'll talk about the peace and satisfaction we find in Christ. Yeah. Uh, the peace I leave with you, my peace I give to you, not as the world do I give to you. Let your hearts not be, or let your hearts not be troubled, neither let them be afraid. Um, peace here comes from the word shalom. Yeah. And a lot of times we see that as just peace. Because that's, I guess, the American English translation yeah, of yeah. the word. Peace, dude. But it's it's so much deeper than that. Shalom is actually a things as they should be. It's it's the idea of uh, completeness. It's not just don't have war. Right. It's so much bigger than that. And I think when there's peace in the home, when we have things the way they should be, yeah. and things are complete as they should be, that is when we really see our kids become the disciples. There you go. That they need to be. That's good. That's good. And uh, I, I really, I, I think it was great. I don't know. Did when you were doing your sermon calendar, did you plan it out that these this whole passage that you used on this Sunday would fall? No. On no. Mother's Day. No. It, in fact, I remember cringing a little bit because when I went through the gospel, I was looking at just how to break up the gospel and right. put it in the calendar. And then I thought, okay, here's the section about eat my flesh on Mother's Day. Hmm, that's going to be a weird. You know? <laughs> right, right. So no, no, just happy little, happy little. It's amazing anyway. how the Holy Spirit kind of steps in sometimes yeah. and makes things work out the yeah. way they're supposed yeah. to. Yeah. Um, it was a great yeah. Sunday. Weekend. Great Sunday. Great. I mean, just great seeing so many families there. Yeah. Um, huge mm. amount of people there this Sunday, which was really fun. It just makes for a very exciting day. Um John, next week, what are we talking about? Uh, John chapter seven. Uh, so, so G, it's we're gonna have a, a a bump in time. So we're near Passover when this previous passage happens, and uh, and now it's gonna be about eight months later, and uh, it's gonna be the Feast of Tabernacles, and Jesus is going to eventually go into Jerusalem, where the Jews are seeking to kill him actively. Oh wow! Yeah, so this is times. where the the idea of Jesus being an outlaw is really gonna mm -hmm. put on some flesh and bones yeah. this next week. Yep, that's it. Very cool, very cool. Well, thank you guys for tuning in to the Leesburg Talk podcast. If you've never done it before, check out the Leesburg Daily podcast as well. We do daily devotional thoughts on there as well. And John, as always, it's a joy hanging out with you. Adios. So See we'll ya. catch you guys on the next one. Mm -hmm.